get on the, the app. We'll have a few uh, sort of fun audience questions to seed the discussion. <laughs> People are choosing their uh, usernames, interestingly. I saw Donald Trump, I think. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Either that or is he yeah. here? <laughs> no. Danger. <laughs> yeah, I know. Quick hang up. So we'll give this a couple more minutes. <laughs> Okay, so what technology area do you think is holding back space exploration the most right now? Take a vote. We have propulsion, sensing, communication, computing. Oh. I like the outer solar system. <laughs> Yeah, power's, power's still appearing. Oh, power's not on there. Power's not on here. All right, I think that's... Propulsion, oh, yeah. Yes. Sounds about right. <laughs> oh, sure. second. Yeah. Overwhelmingly propulsion. That's what you're trying to do, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so where should we send the next mission to look for life in the solar system? <laughs> <laughs> Mars, Venus, Mars, Two Enceladus, Mars. Europa. Mars shows up twice, interesting. Mars. <laughs> Someone really maybe, wants Mars. Maybe. <laughs> or other. I want to know what the others are also. So if, you, if you're an other, Triton, please speak Triton. up. Exoplanets. Yeah. Well, it said in the solar system, oh, so it was specified. All right, so we have strong representation for Enceladus yeah. with a uh, Europa coming in a distant right. second. Even when the Marsies are added together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not too many votes for Mars. Okay, uh, what do you think the biggest game changer for space exploration will be in the next 10 years? So we have uh, new launch vehicles, smaller, cheaper spacecraft, AI, or something else. Okay, this one's more fun. We've got yeah. opinions here. So we have uh, new launch vehicles and smaller, cheaper spacecraft in a near tie. I like it. All right then. Thanks everyone. Uh, so I guess maybe we can kick things off with uh, an initial uh, couple of questions, but the idea here is very much to, uh, for you guys to uh, ask questions now. So. Uh, you can start raising your hands, and I think we get to throw cushy microphone boxes at you, which should be throw, fun. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there's a couple of them. Do we have to do questions, relative. then throw the mics? How, what's, the, what's the setup? Uh, we... Yeah, so just to sort of get those going, maybe oh, okay. we can ask one or two. Um, I guess maybe I can start. Uh, I was thinking about, uh, throughout the discussion, um, uh, going back to the new launch vehicle topic and, and a lot of the other things we've been seeing with new space, a lot of uh, interesting commercial activity going on and uh, a lot of us come from academia or NASA, right? So I'm wondering uh, people's thoughts on the role of private industry here. Uh, it still seems like ultimately most of the money that's funding these private companies is coming from NASA or government sources, but uh, what do we think is going to happen, say, with Elon's plans for Mars and, and this sort of thing. Where, what's the role of, of private money uh, in these things? That's for anybody who has a take. I mean, my experience with the, with the commercial lunar payload services uh, program is that it's much more risk tolerant, right? Which is great, right? So you can, you can try new things and you can, you can, uh, you can pro well, you can see, you can fail. But I think that's gonna introduce a lot of uh, ideas into this year. More risk is good. More risk is good, yeah. And another advantage is redundancy, right? So you have a choice of prov providers, hopefully, soon. And uh, if one of them is having problems, you know, you can switch over. Like one of our NASA missions uh, had to switch over from one launch provider, small uh, uh, launch vehicle provider, to another one. And 
it, it was done in a matter of months. More options are good. Yeah. Is there a sustainability angle on this? Oh, I, I mean, I think it's, we're also seeing the growth of launch vehicle providers from you know, pre, uh, fully civilian, previously unseen backgrounds, right? So I, I've been seeing the growth of Rocket Lab in New Zealand to go from kind of you know, the last 10 years to suddenly being a fully fledged full stack launch provider. And uh, that's been quite, uh, uh, at least for our student community, quite transformative in the way that they think about what uh, they could be involved in with aerospace. So that's been a really big development in the way um, the New Zealand uh, uh, aerospace and astronomy community has, has seen itself. Great. Yeah, so we have already realized tremendous benefits from commercial activities, and I am a huge fan of it. Our missions are all cheaper because we have lower cost launch vehicles. That has absolutely transformed the way that we're doing business. I want to see more and more of that. Actually, my background is in aeronautics, and I'm very used to having the commercial industry you know, make money off of productive activities and have government provide help and expertise and environments and facilities and all that, and I can't get there fast enough. Excellent. All right. Uh... Shall I go ahead and ask? Okay, I, I've got one as well. So we've talked a lot about robotics in this session, and that's great. Um, and robotics is coming on a long way, as we've heard. So why bother sending people? It, it, robots, just the, especially autonomous robots, is that is that the future, or is there still a, a space for human spaceflight? Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so ask any geologist in the field: Would they want to just send a rover and go do exploration, or would they like to be there and make the decisions to find the unknown unknowns? Uh, couple that with the deep, you know, uh, desire for humans to explore. Mm -hmm. I think absolutely there's room for human exploration and scientific um, exploration, and you know, it, it's a great coupling. Go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, I do a lot of the robotics, but I absolutely agree with you because one, uh, they're complementary. So I think as we see on Earth even with the Industrial Revolution and everything, we still continue to have things humans do well, and we'll find that in space. And they are going to be the frontier because, you know, the resources needed for survival for a robot is so much lo lower. And, but I think absolutely humans are going to follow, you know, as we explore with robots. Yeah, and I think there's been a certain level of the, uh, um, as the capacity of our robotic exploration has grown, People have also become much more used to, um, to, the, to the capacity and the capabilities that you have matching the kind of ideals that you can have. So things like uh, um, positioning the, uh, uh, the, the mast cams such that you have them at human eye spacing so you get that human experiential thing of what it's like to, as the rover moves across Mars. We're exploring in ways and with you know, sensory capability that are very um, more, much broader than human, but we're also trying to do this in a way that does convey what it is like to be there from the human sensory experience too. All right, so maybe it's time for our first audience question then. Uh, who has the mic box? Over there. Over there. Okay. Hi, um, thanks for the great talks. This is maybe a question for Carolyn. Um, so China's building a big um, maglev launcher for a hypersonic space plane, and um, yeah, you know, much like NASA is reviving nuclear propulsion, are there any plans to revive magnetic launch? I do not know of any plans to revive magnetic launches within NASA, and I, I don't know what's going on at other government agencies. Okay, thank you. And then right back here. Okay, that's just, you hear me? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. My question is for Edward, and uh, you talk about the injection of liquid, but I didn't understand if uh, the final result is a liquid lens, a liquid mirror, is it correct? 50 yeah, meters uh, a liquid mirror, because my doubt is about uh, the performance of such a lamp. Um, or not, or, it, or if we discuss about also a, a solid lens, the, of course the approach is completely different, right? 
Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, actually, it's the same approach um, as it turns out. So we can create both lenses and mirrors, uh, and we can keep them liquid, uh, either lenses or mirrors, or solidify them using the same uh, general approach. So um, in the simplest form, to create a mirror, imagine uh, making a, instead of a convex lens, a concave lens. Then, you know, one of the surfaces of that concave lens, if the liquid is reflective, can, can serve as a mirror. Right. Hey, um, thank you so much to all the speakers for a really interesting session. Uh, so I've got a question, I guess, for Michelle and, and a bit to Stuart as well. Uh, like most astronomers, I'm very worried about satellites. Uh, I was very excited about the far side of the moon, and now I'm scared that, that we're going to lose that pretty soon, too. Um, I think for society, we've seen a lot of uh, emphasis on taking care of the environment, and the general public has kind of gotten on board with this message. Do we see the same thing happening to try to protect the skies? Um, like, is, is this something that's being raised in the awareness of the general public, or is that still to come? Because that's probably what it's going to take to enforce policy changes and, and actually protect our skies. I think we definitely do. It's, it does vary depending on um, things like people's ability to go out and connect to the sky as well. So it, as ever, if you have that experiential connection, it's much easier to then go, oh, this is something that I, that I care about. And one of the things that we have is on a lot of continents in the world, we now have 80% of the population or more who can never see the Milky Way because of the in, um, optical light pollution that's happening from how we're constructing cities and things. So going past that to the, uh, um, to, to the level of pollution that's being created to, uh, with this industrial activity, um, you know, it, it is an awareness thing as well. And I think we're making a lot of progress with it uh, on the industry side as well, but it is definitely going to be a, a moving conversation of how do we look after this environment in a way that you know, is there a carrying capacity for near-Earth orbit? Is there a carrying capacity for the ozone layer for how many launches is a sensible amount of launches? These are the conversations we need to be having before we have problems at levels that they're causing critical environmental damage. Can I ask a slight follow-on to that? Is, is there any upside to these mega constellations from a, you know, an astronomer's perspective? So, for example, on the engineering side, there's been people who've used the signals from these things as navigation aids, like sort of opportunistically. It's been kind of interesting. I don't know if there's any similar uh, upside to these things. Uh, nothing immediately coming to mind. So, the optical, the all, all downside. <laughs> <laughs> there. All right. right here. Uh, hi, panel. Uh, Becky Spethers, Oxford. Um, I have a question about contamination, especially on Carly's point about do no harm. I think one of the biggest arguments against you know, human exploration, as we were just talking about, is that if you send humans to Mars, for example, how do you then prove that there may have been life on Mars in the past? Because the argument will always be there of contamination. So, Vanny, I'm curious, with your experience with the rovers on Mars, you know, how sure are we that what we sent there is like, completely sterile, especially after we've seen that you know, these little tardigrades can survive on the outside of the International Space Station? And thinking very far into the future of, say, dream scenario, we detect even more evidence that there could be life in the, the plumes of Enceladus, for example, and we want to send something subsurface on Enceladus. How sure are we that we can send something that is completely sterile and will not contaminate any environment in the solar system? That's a really good question, and it's actually really challenging. And so before, when we were doing uh, sort of more remote observations, the constraints were a little bit less, but now, especially with Perseverance, where we actually, there's two things there. One is not contaminating that environment, and the second is if you're considering bringing samples back, you need to also be careful about that. So those requirements were very stringent, and the temperatures to which you need to heat things and look at the contamination levels was unprecedented. So there's it, literally a whole area of research about how do you do that while still producing parts that can survive in space and, and, and meet those requirements. In terms of just practicality, so you do all of that, make sure that you know, it's, it, it doesn't take any contaminants from Earth, and then we take witness samples. So if you saw in one of my slides I had 
at different times, once you've collected intacted cores, you take a sample with nothing in it. And that's sort of the baseline that you can subtract from the other measurements because it was in situ and now you've got taken it through the whole same mechanisms. And so there are other ways to remove that noise. I think there's also, it's a, it's a philosophical question that we have to answer, right, as, as a people. You know, exploration is good. Learning about new worlds is good. Not hurting them, very good. Right? And, and so how, how do we ensure that we, the stuff we send is clean enough, right? That, you know, that there, there are mechanisms for, for constructing that rubric, but can we ever hand on heart say we, we're never going to be able to send anything there? That, that's a really tough statement to be able to meet. And I think that's why I think that's why I'm particularly excited about the idea of plumes, especially on Enceladus, where we know that they're going off all the time and that they're connected to the subsurface ocean. Because I think there's there's a really easy way of sampling that subsurface without doing damage to it. Uh, it and I think it is a conversation that we we need to have along along with some of the other topics we've talked today about you know, where does that where is that line between curiosity and, and harm, and, and how does that move as our technology improves? And, and as our ability to study these things improves in the future. So I don't think there's an easy answer to that one. Um, but it is something we should be talking about. I think it is also something where it's a nice ex example, this particular question of the kind of international cooperation that we need around these issues, is we have standards for planetary protection that are internationally discussed at form forums like COSPA. And so that's a great example. We can already do this, of thinking about this in a collegial way. Is, is there an online question? Oh, yeah. So I got a few from Zoom. Uh, Zoom is heating up. Uh, these are all for Edward. Edward, uh, can you say a bit more about why you mentioned the lens size doesn't matter at the beginning of the talk? What property in the image are you looking for is lens size invariant? Or did you mean the manufacturing complexity is not limited by its size? And another one, uh, if the flute is disturbed, say, by a micrometeorite impact, how long does it take the capillary waves to dissipate? And I think there might just be one more real question. Uh, would it be possible to use microfluids to develop reflector elements for radio telescopes as well? Or would that not be feasible? OK. Uh, great questions. So let me start from the last one, and I'll work my way back. Um, we have actually looked into um, using the fluid approach to create radio telescopes. Um, in fact, there was a uh, DARPA program um, a few years ago uh, called NOMAD that uh, its goal was to create large structures in space. But one of the applications were, uh, were um, radio telescopes. So, and we, we looked into it in some detail and we thought uh, we should be able to do it. Uh, but for various reasons, we decided not to apply to that program. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think as long as you have a conductive liquid or a conductive uh, surface layer uh, of the mirror, uh, we can do a radio telescopes as well. Um, the second question was about, uh, uh, could you remind me? Please. It was about micrometer oh, impact. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yes, as I mentioned, one of the advantages of keeping uh, a mirror or a lens uh, liquid in space is that it's um, damage tolerant. Um, we are actually doing the, the more detailed modeling of micrometeorite impact um, disturbances uh, right now, uh, so under uh, NIAC phase two funding. So we don't have exact answers yet, but our gut feel is that at most it should take uh, a matter of days to, for the disturbances to settle after micrometeorite uh, impact but hopefully we'll, we'll have more concrete results soon. Uh, and the first question was on... Scale invariance. Scaling, yes. Um, yeah, it, it's... The basic physics of this approach are actually quite simple. So it's just 
adhesion to the frame and uh, surface tension of the liquid. So we see no reason um, until we get to you know, relativistic sizes that uh, it wouldn't work for you know, uh, sizes of um, kilometers or tens of kilometers if, if we can solve the engineering problem of creating a frame large enough and lifting enough liquid to, to fill it up. Uh, but yeah, theoretically, it, it should be very scalable. All right. Hi, thank you everyone uh, for wonderful talks. I come from computer science. So my question is, I guess, is from Vandi and Michelle. So it's very heartening to see that there is a direct push on uh, robotic, designing robotic systems for gaining more autonomy. But as somebody who has been designing such systems, autonomous systems, the moment we talk about autonomy, wings of autonomy cannot be gained without shackles of like, you know, how do you test those systems, the trust in the system itself. And from my lay, lay person's perspective, like, you know, to replicate those testing conditions on Earth for um, space robotic considerations to trust the efficacy of the system is probably not easy. So here comes my question. So what, how, what kind of space analogous conditions you create for testing the efficacy of robotic systems which are deployed, not just free roaming ones, but the ones which are actually like, you know, in the proximity of the astronauts inside, for example, in ISS-like environments. Now, in order to design those space analogous systems, do you learn from your mistakes, especially like, you know, from over-reliance or, uh, Autonomy, automation bias, et cetera. And if, like, you know, you, if you learn from, in order to enrich these space analogous test environments, if you learn from your past mistakes, then if there is a repository of those past mistakes which are publicly available for people like us to play around with. So I think the essence of the question was do we learn from our mistakes? Is that? Sure. And testing, our and testing, testing. testing. Sorry, it's a little bit yeah. hot here. Okay. So yeah, and actually, you know, I mean, you bring up a good point. As things, if we are sort of directing things, that's been one of the constraints is it's predictable. And predictability means you can test because you can, you know, your model reflects the reality very well. As they get more autonomous, it is less so. So we look, you know, one is you do want to try to test in pieces. We almost very rarely actually have been doing these drives on Mars for a very long time. Nothing we've done on Earth exactly replicates things we do there. So you also put bounds on it. So you know that you put constraints, and we have, for example, I'm going to give you a very simple example in V-Drive. The autonomous robot, as soon as it gets imagery on the surface, has more information than the humans on Earth had, which are navigating it. But you put a bound on it, say, I know if you go outside of this region, and it could be very large, hundreds of meters, uh, something unexpected has happened. This violates an assumption very large, and so we're going to use some other technique to compensate. So that's another way in which you can create these bounds. But you try to uh, come up with better test uh, approaches. A lot of it is actually automated testing so that you could do that. And then the second question was... Uh, Are there sort of publicly available repositories of test data, lessons learned for, right. from things like and this? So they actually, um, NASA, a lot of the anomalies and all, there is a database that is available. It is, there's so much information. This is one of those cases where AI can help us. It's almost too much information. And so if you went in there, you're like, you're finding things that have been fixed and others. So I think this is gonna be better in the future. And data sets, I think it's important. And we're working a lot to make them available. And this is something where every time we collaborate, this is one of the great, not you, you get new, ideas, but also in order to collaborate with students, with universities and others, we have to figure out how to put that data out and it causes that to happen more and more. Uh, so there's that. Um, and then, you know, images, every image in some of the missions that I've been involved with, uh, actually they go onto the pu public side immediately as soon as they come down. Uh, so th that is also there. Maybe I can ask a slight riff on this question. So as a roboticist, we're used to, you know, thinking about autonomy a lot, uh, recently AI, and how we, we can trust these things, right? And it's usually in robotics in the context of things like autonomous driving and safety and, you know, not hitting humans and things like this. But I wonder, there's been a lot of, you know, discussion the last couple of days about 
AI and its increasing use in data analysis and astronomy and in, in science more generally, and how we need these things on board missions to sort of pre-filter data and make decisions about how to use limited bandwidth to send these things back to Earth. In this kind of scientific context where we're looking for new things that we haven't seen before that almost by definition can't be in the training data, so to speak, uh, how do we build trust in these sort of AI systems in, in like maybe the broader context of science? Have a take? I, I mean, I'd, I, unless you want it. So I think one of the interesting things is that Yes, and yet at the same time, you know, humans do do some of this. So we actually had an approach, it hasn't been deployed, continuation of the Aegis algorithm I talked about, which was, you can also say, I have this data set. Now you have all the data that we do have. What I'm interested in is something different from this data set. So that is novelty detection. But also, oftentimes you want multiple sensors to corroborate the information, because what if there's a bias? And so you, you want both. You want novelty, but you also say, if I've seen something that's different, I want to take multiple measurements of it so I know this wasn't just some noisy. I, I really want the astronomer take on this. <laughs> would, do you, would you trust, uh, a, say, an, a machine learning algorithm to uh, decide what data to send back from an outer solar system mission? That's oh. the, the pointed version of this question. Or how, <laughs> how, how could we get you there? Uh, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of outer solar system sky surveys, so, so for me it's always, you know, our field is kind of at the, the, the tipping point of starting to include more of that now, um, but in the past we've done these much more manually, and uh, I do admit this is something that, you know, kind of personally I'm, I'm evolving my approach to, but uh, I would definitely... <sighs> There's a lot of reassurance <laughs> with going back and having a look at the data yourself. I mean, you'd have to sample and go, you don't always know what it is you don't know. And I think that's the thing I'd be most concerned about, of what are we missing that we haven't spotted yet. So there are some autonomous, uh, so there's a, there's a mission called Lucy right now, which is in, it's gonna go and look at Jupiter's Trojan asteroids, but it's flown through a main belt asteroid and it will fly through another one next April on Easter Sunday because space missions have to ruin holidays. That's a, that's a rule. Um, and it has a terminal tracking on there. So the idea being that it can see where the limb is and you can collapse your error lips so you image just the bit with the, with the object in. And the first time we flew by something, the, the scientists were like, okay, well, let's just keep the same error lips, but we'll see how the terminal tracking does. And it performed amazingly. And so now we're going into our second main belt asteroid. We're sort of trusting it a little bit more. And I think that's the way it happens, right? You experience it. In, in about something you care about, right? I care about these observations. Um, and so, and it, and it worked, and you can see the benefits, and so you trust it a little bit more. And so I think it happens incrementally. I don't think there's one moment where you go, okay, robot, you go for it. Um, but it's also necessity, you know, as we, as we start, the, as was talked about yesterday, the light times as you go into the outer solar system are long, you can't do anything in real time. It's not feasible to operate a rover on Pluto in anything like real time, right? So I think necessity will also drive that as well. And I do want to make one point, right? We, when we talk about using onboard either autonomy or AI to filter the data, and we talk about how that might introduce biases, we f forget to talk about the absolute bias that we already have by the data we didn't collect yeah. and the data that we didn't send back down. So it's not just a bias on one way. Yeah. I have, I have a comment on this too. So I have an instrument on the the Parker Solar Probe uh, spacecraft. And there we have you know, s very high cadence data and we have to make choices about the data and we have some very s simple algorithms. They're not learning algorithms, but simple alg algorithms to make those choices. But we also have something we call an honesty channel. And the honesty channel just sends back random events, you know, random, random data. That keeps us, keeps us true. Yes. Anybody else is that? <laughs> <laughs> so in my... Uh, day job, I'm actually thinking about this topic a lot. Uh, so we um, develop, uh, we're developing uh, systems for um, uh, robotic uh, spacecraft. And um, so one of the ways we do it um, to verify that we can trust it is through, you know, beating that system up through stochastic simulations. Um, and doing it over and over, trying to find the most unlikely scenarios and, and see how um, it responds. 
uh, one of the techniques is what we call adaptive stress testing, uh, where you know the goal is to fail the system. So that algorithm will go and try different ways, different permutations of parameters, different actions to get to a failure, right? And and do it um, as exhaustively as possible. And another way uh, that we, we actually just submitted a funding proposal f for this is to, um, there is a way to pre-compute autonomy, to basically reduce it to a lookup table of some state to an action that should be taken in that system state. And since it's a simple um, lookup table, it can be extensively verified and validated on the ground before the mission is launched. Uh, and then if the environment is different, a new table can be computed. That's actually um, the same approach that's currently being used in an aircraft collision avoidance system uh, that's being deployed on uh, US registered uh, commercial airliners for uh, deconflicting uh, aircraft traffic. As he was mentioning, I was going to add, like, in terms of research and doing a breakthrough, like, formal methods are making a lot of progress as yeah. well, right? But the scalability is currently an issue. But you can imagine, just as we're seeing with AI, that, that, that you eventually that'll be one way, where then you can make some assertions about it. All right. Uh, audience question? Can, can, just before we go oh, on, right, can I just make one point? If we could have the next few questions from the audience to be young um, researchers, how, if you identify as a young researcher, please do make sure you get, and you've got a burning question, make sure you get one of those cubes and asked it before the, the end of But if, if the cube's already distributed, let's do that, and then the next, the next rounds. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Hey, I'm go Kevin ahead. Wagner. I'm a postdoc at University of Arizona, so I think I fit this bill. Um, excellent. My question is for Hold that closer to your mouth. Oh, is there a microphone in it? That oh, is a cool. microphone, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Kevin Wagner, a postdoc from University of Arizona. Um, my question's for Edward, and first I want to commend you for this novel idea. I think it would be excellent if we could see multiple flagship observatories in our lifetime instead of just one more. Um, now my question is, what drives the cost of the mission? Is it the diameter of the mirror? And if so, could you accomplish the same sort of science in terms of light collecting area with a number of smaller observatories for cheaper compared to one giant observatory. Thanks. Sure, uh, great question. Um, the, yeah, the majority of the cost will be in uh, the engineering design of the frame, uh, of the large frame that we need to deploy, and in the mass of the liquid that we need to lift to, to fill it up. Um, we see approach cannot be used in an interferometry array, uh, so multiple um, uh, distinct mirrors. Uh, there are advantages uh, to having a single monolithic surface you, you get, you know, uh, filled with your aberration. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, when it comes to uh, astronomy, the the more light collecting surface, the more photons you can collect, the better, right, at the end of the day. So whether separated into multiple independent mirrors or a single mirror, the more area, light collecting area you have, the better. All right. So if I could add to that, right? So the cost of a great observatory, though, is not necessarily dominated by the cost of the mirror. It depends on what that observatory is trying to do. So for instance, with the Hab Worlds Observatory, they're going to be flying a coronagraph on it because it's going to be looking for exoplanets. And that coronagraph has to be very stably, very precisely located at the point spread function of the mirror system, which means the entire spacecraft has to be really stable and really precise. And that's very expensive. And for James Webb, right, it had to be really cold, so it had multiple layers of that thermal to sun shield. And so, absolutely, the cost of the mirror is a factor. I, and it's probably a very big factor, but I don't know if it's the dominant factor. Depends on the spacecraft. Hi. 
this microphone? Perfect. Uh, Bram de Winter, PhD, University of Oxford. Uh, I just have a more global uh, question about space exploration. Um, so it's quite interesting or complex, just the way you see it. Times of space exploration with budgets and then also a uh, very much an interest in human exploration um, towards Mars. How does how do we make sure that scientific exploration is still, you know, getting the freedom in budget wise to push whatever we want, or do we have to like go with human exploration in order to achieve the goals that we want to make? Thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear. This is, I guess, a, a question about uh, human exploration again and uh, budgets, I, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. I think it was more is, is our space exploration in the solar system coupled to the human exploration that's taking place? All right. So I can take that one. Um, so the Artemis program, as you know, has really um, done a good job of laying out objectives for what those people are going to do when they get to the moon and then subsequently to Mars. And they have done that, um, I, I would say, unique uh, uh, from all of the other uh, missions that we've been planning to go back to the moon. They've been doing it really collaboratively with the science community. And so we, are, we have science objectives for the astronauts. We have science objectives for Artemis. We have science objectives for the elements that they're designing. But having said that, we still have a robust science program that's completely independent of Artemis. And we still go through our decadals and we get our, uh, you know, from the community what our science objectives are. So it, it's not an either or, it's a both. All right, so uh, I think we're just about to the end of time, but maybe we can close with one more. We can ask the panel their, their favorite place uh, to send a mission in the solar system to look for life. The, uh, Everyone's hot take. Starting with me, uh, oh, I had to go with Triton after the talk I gave. It'd probably be Triton or Enceladus. Enceladus, really, because we know there's gonna be plumes and you could fly through them, but Triton, because we don't know what's there and there's dragons and aliens, so both. Sorry. <laughs> Andy? Uh, you know, uh, I see robotics as a means to the end for science, so essentially where you expect to have the most chances of life, it would be awesome to send an actual robotic mission to, to confirm that. And, you know, in the decadal, there is certainly Enceladus as one of those areas where a robotic mission could make sense, but, you know, wherever it makes sense. Yeah, Enceladus or Europa or any ocean world, I think they're all great. Yeah, yeah definitely Team Ocean World, and I think this is one of the, <laughs> <laughs> the underappreciated things of the solar system is just how many habitable environments we have. All these little oceans with their lovely icy crusts just waiting to be explored. So I will add one like, slight provocative note on that, which is in the early stages, that lovely simulation Carly was showing of the scattering of the um, objects in the outer solar system. Think of how many of those had interior oceans in them and then have been flung out between the stars. So imagine if we have in the population of interstellar objects a whole set of ocean worlds just waiting to be explored. Uh, not going to be controversial, I think, ocean worlds, uh, Enceladus in particular, because of what Carly mentioned, the plumes uh, should be easier to sample than trying to drill through, you know, a lot of ice. Here, here, Enceladus, the plumes. All right, yeah, I'm probably on Team Enceladus too, but I just wanted to, I was seeing if we'd get any, any Venus atmosphere people. All right, no, we'll nobody's into, all right. With that, uh, let's uh, thank our panel one more time and it's time for lunch.